Okay, so I did previously, I did a video, uh, a summary, everything you need to know for the final exam for physics, but it was the first semester covered momentum and energy and forces. And so now I'm gonna make the same thing for part two. Uh, this is electricity and magnetism. So I'm, I'm doing this with the viewpoint for a calculus-based physics course. Um, this is the stuff that goes along with actually uh, the textbook Matter and Interactions by Chabay and Sherwood. Awesome book, check it out, favorite book ever. But it should work, the same idea, physics is physics, right? So it should work no matter what your textbook is. Um, now, don't think that you can just watch this video and spend an hour watching this video and boom, you got it. You got to work problems, okay? You got to study things. You got to get confused. That's part of the learning process. So this is just kind of like a where you need to be and where you should have been by now. So don't don't think of this as the end all be all of everything. Um, so with that, I think let's just get started. So I'm going to turn off this camera right here. Uh, I do have some planned breaks for you uh, so that we can, uh, you know, take a little side tour but this is physics 2 electricity and magnetism and so the very first thing that we want in here is the definition of the electric field and again i'm not giving a full explanation i'm telling you what you need to know so if i have a uh, point charge q and i want to find the electric field at some location over here let's call that ro that's a vector and the location of the charge i'll call that rq then this is the vector from ro from rq to ro is going to be R is equal to RO minus RQ. I'm already taking too long, I can tell. Then the electric field, E, is going to be E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over the magnitude of R squared R hat, where 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught equals 9 times 10 to the ninth newtons meter squared per coulomb squared, and coulomb is the unit of charge. Now, some people ask, well, where, how can you derive this, right? This is a unit vector r hat. This is important because if I write the electric field as a vector, then I need the right-hand side as a vector too. And that's a scalar because you can't square a vector. So that's super important. Um, so, but where does this come from? It comes, it's experimentally determined. So you, you measure things, uh, these forces experimentally, and then from, and the distances between charges, and you can find that. So I guess I should say this, F equals... Q E. So if I put a charge in an electric field E, then the force on it's going to be Q times E. And so then you can have, if you have two Qs in here, it'd be the force. Okay, Q1, Q2. Uh, what if I have two charges in particular? What if I have a dipole? This is a really great char uh, problem. Uh, two charges separated by a distance S. Well, the electric field due to these, the electric field is a base superposition. So if I have a point over here and I have two different R vectors like that, then I get uh, this would actually be E minus, and this would be E plus. And so the total electric field would be the vector sum of those two. And you can do that for many charges as you want. Uh, if you derive, I don't know if you care, but um, it's kind of useful. The electric field due to a dipole, the magnitude, is going to be equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2 Q S over r cubed, where q is the magnitude of one of the charges and s is the separation. And this is actually what we call the dipole moment. Uh, and this is for along the axis of a dipole. If you go on the perpendicular axis, there's no two there. And that's just for the magnitude, OK? Uh, electric field, dipole, uh, superposition, OK. Uh, properties of matter. Uh, so let's switch over to this. If I have a metal. We can, we can model a metal as though it has a bunch of atomic positive cores with negative charges that can move around if it's a metal. So a metal uh, or an electric conductor has these negative charges that are able to move around a little bit. And that does make a big difference because now if I apply an electric field to the situation, then these negative charges are going to experience a force and they'll end up more of them over here that will leave extra charges over there and we'll have polarization and the result of this is that uh, the electric field inside of here e n is zero 
So these charges are going to move around to make the electric field zero. If the electric field is not zero, then those charges would move and it wouldn't be in static equilibrium. What if it's not a conductor? What if it's an insulator? If it's an insulator, then these charges still can move a little bit and they do become polarized. Uh, it doesn't make the electric field zero inside. Uh, let's see, charge is conserved. I'm trying to think some other important things. There's all this stuff about charging by induction. Um, I'm just trying to think of other big things. There is a drift velocity. Uh, we'll get in, in matter and interactions, it's a big deal. So let me go ahead and say that. If I have, let's say, a wire, and I have a constant electric field that's not changing, and I'm somehow able to add, uh, let's say, add negative charges over here and take negative charges away over there, then on the inside, they will have some average drift velocity, V equals UE applied. And that's, a, that's an average. Okay, and mu is the, I'm sorry, u is the electron mobility. And this is a property of the material. Basically what happens is these charges accelerate and then collide with the atomic cores and stop and so forth. And this is the average velocity that they would get uh, over there. And that's where we get electric current from. And this connection between electric current and electric field, it's super important. A lot of textbooks kind of just gloss over that, but it is indeed super important. Next page. Uh, what about this? This is one of the things that you're definitely going to do. How would I find the electric field due to this long charged rod? And the answer is, and this is the next part is what you do is you find the electric field due to charge distributions. And so the key here is to always break these into little pieces. Call that DQ. And then I can get an expression for the electric field at that point would just be the electric field due to a, a point charge, dq r squared r hat. And then define, that's dE, because that's only the partial contribution. Then define the total electric field. And this is true for all these cases. You would do this, you'd integrate both sides, and I get E equals the integral from over the whole thing, one over four pi epsilon naught dq r squared r hat hat. That's, that's, that's fine. You can leave it like that. But now the question is, I can't integrate over dq if r changes, right? If In this case, how would I get an expression between dq and r? I could call this the y direction so that I could then write, if this has a total length l and a total charge q, I could say q over l equals dq over dy. Right. This says the linear charge density is constant. So now I can get a relationship between dq and dy. dq equals q over l dy. And now when I plug that in, I can get r in terms of y too. And you can get this into a single variable equation that you can integrate. And that's what you do for the electric field due to a line, the electric field due to a ring, the electric field due to a disk. Um, all of those you may have to derive uh, it depends on your class where, whether you have to memorize them or not. But let me just write down, let's say, the electric field due to a rod. The magnitude is equal to, and I don't memorize this, I'd have to write it down. Uh, it's approximately equal to, if you're really close, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, I'm looking at it, 2q over L over R. That's a rod. And, but the important thing is that you can check the units. It should still have units of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, q over r squared. So here I have q over r and I have q over l. So I do get q over distance squared. So it has the right units. Also, as I get really far away from this rod, as I increase r, r would be the, this distance right here, then the electric field should go to 0. And as r goes to infinity, this does go to 0. So you can check these things. And in some cases, you can even check that if I make this really tiny, then it should look like the electric field due to a point charge. You can check these things and make sure you at least have a, a, re a reasonable value. Um, but coming up with these calculations, they all rely on this trick of finding some charge density. It could be a volume charge density, it could be a linear charge density, uh, and then you get to some integral that hopefully is integratable without using an integral table. But if it is, maybe you can use an integral table on your exam. Okay. Moving right along. I'm going faster than I thought. I'm kind of happy. Okay, let's talk about electric potential difference.
This is a big deal. So uh, if you go back to your uh, first physics course, you remember that uh, the following work is defined as the integral from point 0.1 to 2 of f dot dl, where f is a force and dl is part of a path. This is a path integral. And, and hopefully we only did cases where it was easy to do. Uh, and this was equal to the change in kinetic energy. If this work did not depend on the path, only on the endpoints, then we could actually move it to the other side and make it a potential. So we could say delta u is negative the work. So that'd be negative the integral from 1 to 2 of f dot dl. Now what if I do that with the electric force? Well now I know f is uh, q times e, so this is going to be negative the integral qe, that's the electric force, dot dl, and it's from 1 to 2. And that's the change in electric potential energy. Uh, you have to do an integral, okay, because the electric field probably is not constant. If the electric field is constant, you can pull that out of the integral, but that's only in special cases. So special case, special, I'm writing it out. Uh, e equals constant, a constant vector. See, I put a vector sign over that. Then I can say the change in electric potential energy is equal to negative Q E dot delta R, where delta R is the displacement and E is electric field vector. Now what if I divide both sides by Q in both of these equations? I get delta V, which is the electric potential, not potential energy. I agree, the units are confusing. This is in units of joules. <clears throat> this is in units of volts. So delta V is defined as negative the integral from 1 to 2 E dot DL. If constant, delta V equals negative E dot delta R. Only if it's constant. Don't use that for non-constant situations. Okay, I will find you. And I'll be very disappointed. I'm not going to be angry. I'm just going to be disappointed. Uh, the important thing here, remember, work is a path integral. So you have to have an end and a beginning for the integral. That's why potential energy is always a change. And that's since the electric potential energy is a potential energy. It's a change. The electric potential is the potential energy divided by the charge. So it's a change. We always deal with change. However, you will see this. V equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. This is the electric potential due to a point charge, and it doesn't look like a change, but it is. This, if you do this integral, and you put in the electric field due to a point charge, and you start from infinity and you go up to R, you get this. So this is with respect to infinity. So at infinity, we set the potential equal to zero, uh, and then this will be the potential at some point with respect to infinity. Electric potentials also obey superposition. So if I have a charged rod like this, I can find the potential at some location by again breaking this into pieces, dq, and then say dv equals uh, the integral of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught dq over r. And I can do the same kind of thing I did with the electric field, except this is in some ways easier because this is a scalar value, right? Once I integrate for work and for potential energy, then I have this dot product, E dot DL, and I get a scalar value. And so I don't, I don't, it's kind of easier to integrate because I don't have to worry about angles and vectors and stuff like that, okay? Uh, dielectrics. Dielectric. Uh, if, if I have an electric field applied to some insulator with a, a, a dielectric constant kappa, some people put K, but we use K for something else, uh, then the electric, the uh, a s effective electric field inside, then the applied electric field, what it's going to do is polarize the material in here, which will make another net electric field. So inside, E inside, is going to be equal to E applied divided by the dielectric constant. 
And so different materials have different dielectric constants. And now it's time for a break. I told you I'd give you little breaks. 15 minutes, that's good. Okay, let's see, switch to this. Uh, I have some things I'd like to show you. I found this. Check that out. So this, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I really like it. It's, it's thick, solid copper. Uh, and it's really useful. I should have saved this for later. Uh, as electric current runs through here, then this will make a, a magnetic field on the inside. And since the wire is really thick, you can run a lot of current through here and you can make a strong magnetic field. I think this might have been used for uh, an induction heater. And an induction heater, you run electric current back and forth in here to make a changing magnetic field. And you can actually have a device in there that uh, it has an induced current in it and gets really hot because of the current and melts, but it kind of like floats in there. And I want to build that, but I never did. So it's just a good piece to have and it feels really solid. I just like having it. I don't even know where I found it, but I found it somewhere. Now I put it in my office. So, okay. Is that a good break? That one's the best break. I have a better one. Okay, where are we? We did electric potential dielectrics. Um, we should now move on to the magnetic field. <clears throat> so remember if I have a point charge, Q, and that's the vector R, Q, and I want to find the electric field at some other location, R, O, observation location, and that's R, then I say the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q over R squared R hat. Now, if that charge is also moving with some velocity, let's just, let's just pick it like this, V, then it will also make a magnetic field. The magnetic field can be found like this, mu naught over 4 pi Q V cross R hat over R squared. There's a lot right there. Right, because first of all, we have the cross product. Um, I don't really want to write out the full cross product, but I guess we will. So let's see, if you have the vector A equals AX, AY, AZ, the vector B equals BX, BY, BZ, then A cross B can be found as the determinant of X hat, Y hat, Z hat, AX, a Y, A Z, B X, those are X's, B Y, B Z, um, and and you get a three-dimensional vector. Now the important thing here is that the resultant, let's say C, equals A cross B. The vector C is perpendicular to both A and B. And that's what makes these magnetic field problems difficult, right? Because here I have QV, here I have R, which those are opposite directions, so I need it like that. Um, and so what vectors are perpendicular to both of those? There's two. Uh, there's this one, right? It's coming out of the paper. You see that? It's perpendicular to R, and it's perpendicular to uh, QV. Actually, it'd be perpendicular to R hat. That's R hat direction, too. Uh, and then there's another one going into the paper. And so we use the right hand rules. This is my right hand, okay? I like to flex it like that. Um, and such that if your fingers cross uh, QV and then R, your thumb will point in the right direction. So if I do this way, I cross R and then QV. If I do this, I cross uh, QV then R. So that's something that you definitely need to practice, okay? Uh, and and the, the important thing if you're writing and you're right-handed, Put down your writing thing and then do the right hand rule. Otherwise, you're going to try your left hand and that's not correct. And so if you're left handed, uh, what's wrong with you? I'm just kidding. Uh, if you're left handed, don't put down the pen and use the right hand rule. Okay, one more thing. The magnitude of C uh, isn't as useful, but we can write it like this. A, B, sine theta. So where theta is the angle between them. But the still you don't have a vector answer and the magnetic field is a vector. Uh, mu naught over 4 pi is a constant of 10 to the negative 7th. It's negative 7th, right? I don't know. I just had a brain, a brain meltdown right there. I'm going to put my thing. It is 10 to the negative 7th, right? 10 to the negative 7th 
uh, Tesla meters per amp, where Tesla is a unit for the magnetic field. That's a seven. Okay, so that's important. That's the magnetic field due to a point charge. Uh, a lot of times we don't have point charges. Uh, the magnetic field also obeys the superposition principle. What if I have like a wire? Well, I can break this into little pieces. I'll call that of length DL with a vector. And then I can say uh, DB equals mu naught over four pi I DL cross R hat over R squared. So I DL is the same as QV, okay? But now we can do things like uh, find the, the magnetic field due to a long straight wire. So this is very similar to the electric field due to a long rod. Uh, if I want to find, this is my R, uh, that's my DL, and that's my I going that way. Then I can find uh, this vector, let's call that S. Eh, I don't know. Let's call that R, and let's call this RP for the piece. Then I can say DB, did I already write this down? Yeah, D, I already wrote it down. All I have to do is integrate along this whole path. DB is the integral of mu naught over four pi I DL cross R hat over R squared. And then I just need to get uh, DL in terms of this vector here. But again, uh, in this case, DL would literally be the vector zero DY zero, if this is the X, Y direction. So that's not too hard, but I do have to do the cross product with R and have to get this all in terms of one variable. Uh, and sometimes in this case, you could do it in terms of the angle theta. You could do it in terms of dy. I would do it in terms of dy. And you can solve these things. Uh, again, I wouldn't memorize the magnetic field due to wire, but if you're really close, uh, the magnitude B wire is mu naught over four pi, two I over R. Again, you can use the rules to say, does it have the same units as the magnetic field due to a point charge? And you can say, what else can you say? Or you can say, as you get really far away, does it go to zero? Um, you know, you can do the limiting cases. So you can check some things like that. So we have a wire, we have a loop. Um, those are the two most common things. Oh, and a, and a solenoid like this. This would be a solenoid, right? What if you have a, a loop of wire like this? What's the magnetic field? In this case, the other important thing about this is this makes an approximately constant magnetic field on the inside compared to a capacity. These are the two important things. Here's a loop of wire. And that makes a constant B field inside. And then we have this, a capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor makes a fairly constant electric field on the inside. And, and we'll talk about capacitors in just a second when I get to, where did I go? I'm losing my place. Yeah, circuits, which we'll do next. Uh, we'll do circuits and then I'll take another break. How am I doing on time? 23 minutes, okay. Circuits. Now, you know, if, if you think I can't spell, I can't. If you think about the big picture, what are you trying to do? In, in my view, this semester is about that. It's about the electric field and the magnetic field. And so in a lot of traditional classes, you can kind of take a side path into these circuit problems and not make a connection back to electric field and magnetic field. And, and I don't think that's super great. It's, there's a lot of important things in circuits, so don't get me wrong, okay? Um, but I like the matter and interactions because they really focus on the electric field in circuits. Uh, so with circuits, we have something like this. You could draw it like, um, actually I'll draw it the way I, uh, they draw it because it's important. I, I can imagine this, a simple circuit like this. And I'll go up like this. So here's my battery. And then I have a thick wire and a thin wire. And we think about what, what has to be true around this. Well, if this is a positive and the negative, then I'm going to make an electric field in here. 
but the electric field here and the electric field there doesn't have to be the same. What does have to be the same? Uh, we have conservation of charge, right? If I have, let's say, positive charges moving that way, at that the charge is going into that point and the charge is leaving that point has to be the same. Otherwise, it won't be an equilibrium in steady state equilibrium, meaning constant charge flow. So from that, we get the junction rule. This says I in equals I out. So of course that makes sense at this point, the junction between here and there, the current flowing into that point has to be the current flowing out. And since this is a thinner wire uh, right there, you're gonna have to have a faster, faster charge, drip, faster drift velocity. And that means a higher electric field. So the E right here, E2 and E1 are, can't be the same. Uh, if you have more than one wire, uh, you still the junction rule still applies. So I could have something like this, a more complicated situation. These are, let's say, resistors instead of thick and thin wires. And then I could say I1, I2, I3, I4. So in this case, I1 would be I2 plus I3 plus I4. Right, the current coming into this junction has to be equal to the current going out. Otherwise, you have a charge buildup. And that's the junction rule. Now, what about the other rule is the loop rule. This goes back to this delta V equals negative the integral from 1 to 2 E dot DL. And so what if I go from 1 to 1? What if I go from right here, 1, all the way around back to 1? Well, since it doesn't depend on path, this means that uh, delta V around a loop has to be zero. And that's the loop rule. So as I add up E dot DL along this whole thing, I have to get to zero. Uh, what about a battery? Uh, we use the effective potential across a battery called the EMF, the electromotive force. Uh, you know, batteries are actually kind of complicated, uh, but if you say that's like a constant voltage source, uh, at some level that's okay. Of course, it's not actually a constant vo voltage source. It can't produce infinite amount of current, but we can model that in different ways. So that's your, your very basic two things. So the loop rule and the junction rule are the key things. If you understand those, I mean, a lot of the stuff you can work out on your own. Um, Okay, then we have the, the definition of uh, Ohm's law, which is the definition of the relationship between electric current, change in potential, and resistance, where resistance of a wire is equal to L over sigma A, where this is the conductivity. And a lot of times we'll write this as rho L over A, where that's the resistivity. So this says that a longer wire has a, a larger resistance, a, a thicker wire has larger resistance. Remember, I said you can put more current through this because it's really thick. That's a pretty thick wire right there. Um, oh, what about this? The connection between electric current and electric field, I have this. I equals Q N A U E. So that's the, uh, the electric field inside the wire. Uh, this is U, that's the electron mobility, that's a cross-sectional area, that's the uh, charge carrier density, how many charge carriers per cubic meter, and that's the value of the charge, so assuming they're electrons. And then that will be the current in amps, uh, resistances in ohms. Oh, finally, we have the, uh, a capacitor. Uh, I'll put it right here. Uh, if I have this, I have a constant electric field inside of there, and this is a size A, area of A, then we can define, and that's a parallel plate capacitor, but in general, the capacitance is defined as the charge divided by the change of potential. So the more charge I put on here, the greater the change of potential because the greater the electric field. And so uh, this is a relationship that does not depend on the charge, uh, it's the charge per, vol per voltage really, okay? And it doesn't have to be a parallel plate capacitor. You could do it for anything, really. Um, if it is a parallel plate capacitor, it looks like this. The dielectric constant, epsilon naught A over S, where S is the separation. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, and that's a dielectric constant. Okay, break time. I have another, I have another thing for you. Uh, let's see what I have. Are you excited? Oh, there it is. Okay. So 
this, do you know what this is? This is uh, not even opened. Well, we're going to open it. I don't even, I don't really want to cut it. Oh, I do want to cut it. So let's cut this tape. You can see I can't see. Okay. Never been opened. Look what year does this say? It doesn't say. But it says, uh, U.S. equipment, spare parts for the U.S. Navy. This is just in a, in a storeroom, uh, and you know, it's not even being used. Uh, it's just got leftover junk. Um, so if I take this out, I'm almost, actually, I don't even know what it is, but I'm pretty sure. Are you excited? I'm kind of excited. Oh, I don't want to tear the paper. You know, this paper's probably 40s, 50s, so, you know, we're talking maybe 70 years old. Oh, it's, it's not a see-through one. I thought it was a vacuum tube, but now, since it's closed like that, it might be, it is vacuum tube. But usually the vacuum tubes have a clear glass in there so you can see what's going on. Uh, the, the vacuum tube basically is uh, what we use before transistors. It's a way to have a small current change a, a big current. So it's kind of like a switch. Maybe that's not the best answer, but there you go. RCA. Okay, I, have, I didn't drop it. I have one more uh, surprise for you. I'll show you in a little bit. So let's switch back, let's get back to the physics. Okay, here we are. And now we are on magnetic force. So let's go back and think about this. F equals QE. So a charge makes an electric field. And so if I put a charge in an electric field, due to some other charge, it experiences a force. So what makes a magnetic field? Moving charges. So if I put a moving charge in a magnetic field, I get a magnetic force. So I get FB equals um, QV cross B. That's the force on a moving charge in a magnetic field. Now, for both of these cases, you can't make an electric field influence the charge that made it. Right? In this case, uh, the electric field, would be, if I put Q at the location of itself, the electric field would be infinite and just the whole universe would explode. And I don't want that to happen. Okay, uh, We already saw what happened when Thanos got the infinity stones and snapped his finger. It'd be worse than that. I'm just making that up. I don't really know what would happen. And the same thing's true for the magnet. This is a magnetic field force on a ch moving charge in another magnetic field. Okay. Um, if you put these two together, you get what we call the Lorentz force, and it just says Q V cross B plus Q E, and this is the force on a charge in a moving a moving charge in a magnetic field and an electric field, right? So we have both those together because there could be there could be both there could be an electric field and a magnetic field. Uh, what if I have a wire in a magnetic field. Well, then I, that just changes to this. F equals I delta L cross B. So then, again, I can replace QV with I delta L, and that's actually just DF, right? Because that's only the part of the force. If I want to find the total force, I'd have to integrate over the whole thing. What if I have a loop of wire in a constant magnetic field? This one's really popular too. So if I have a, uh, you can think about this. If I have I going around in a loop this way, and I have a magnetic field going into the board. I never said this, but we use this for vectors going into the board and or paper, and this for vectors coming out. It's like an arrow. So if you look at it from this side, you see the, the feathers. If you look at it from this side, you see the point. And that's where those come from. Uh, so if I have a magnetic field going in, what direction is the magnetic force on this side? Would well, be I dl cross b so idl is this way b is that way so i do idl cross b and it'd be this way what about the force on this side now it's going to be this way right same thing so idl and then it's going to be this way and this way and so the net force in this would be zero because all the this force and that force are the same that's the, the same as that if the magnetic field is constant 
Now, what if I have it at an angle? Uh, what if I have it like this? So here's my magnetic field. And this is my loop. So now up here it's going into the paper and here it's going out of the paper. So these side ones are pulling in the opposite directions. Uh, oh, this one. No, that's zero. I. Oh, this is, this is the top up here. Yeah, so the top up here would be pulling this way and the bottom would be pulling that way. And so the, there's a net force of zero. But there's a torque, right? If I think about it from an angle, it's easier to see. If I have my magnetic field going down, then this is going to be a force that way and a force that way, and we get a torque. And the torque on a loop is, we can write this as mu cross b, where mu is the magnetic dipole moment, which is e mu is equal to i times a, the area. Okay. Um, oh, we, we do get these cool things like uh, the Hall effect. If I have a wire with current in a magnetic field, then I have, let's say, uh, negative charge carriers moving that way. Well, what's going to happen? This is QV is going down. So QV cross B is actually going to be QV is that way cross B. It's going to be this way. So we're going to end up with negative charges over here because they're getting, as they, as they move, this way, they actually uh, pile up over here. Uh, and that's going to leave positives over here. And now we're going to end up with an electric field this way to drive the current, an electric field perpendicular because of this charge separation. And then at some point, the electric force on the charges right here is going to equal the magnetic force, and then these will not no longer build up charges. So you can actually, the Hall effect probe, uh, uses this idea to run current through a material, measure the sideways voltage, uh, and from that you can calculate the magnetic field applied. So that's kind of cool. Okay, uh, where am I now? Um, I think the last thing I want to talk about are Maxwell's equations. Yeah, and then, and then, uh, so you may do that things like optics and RC circuits and RLC circuits, and I think those are important and pretty cool. But, you know, I'm just trying to give you the over, overall picture. And so let me show you uh, one more thing, and then we'll do uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, and this is, not, this is not the whole course, right? I hope you understand that. And so, you know, I keep doing the wrong thing. It's computer view. Right here, okay. Does anyone know what this is? So this is part of uh, a calorimeter from Fermilab. So at Fermilab, uh, there are uh, detectors, and you have these particle collisions, and you want to measure the energy. So these are scintillating fiber optics. So when a charged particle enters here, it produces a little bit of light. But it's a fiber optic, so that light can only go along the length of the, of the fiber. And so on this end, you would have a photomultiplier tube that could detect very, very small amounts of light. Uh, so this one I, I took after the whole thing broke. So I spent a summer when I was in high school building this, and so we would lay these fibers, uh, long fibers of three different lengths, into these wedge-shaped pieces of steel and lead. And so the, the fibers that were very short uh, a particle would have to go through more steel and lead to get to them, so that would indicate a higher energy. And then the longer fibers could detect lower energy particles. Um, so it was this big wedge, it was probably two meters long, um, one meter wide, and super heavy. And then when they went to pick it up to move it, the first one that we built, the, the crane was, the mounting point was unstable and the whole thing just went boom and it crashed. And um, I said, well, I'm going to take this. And they said, yeah, you take that, because this just crashed. It's just crap. Uh, so that was from my time as, an, as a, wait, I was an undergraduate student. I was an undergraduate at Fermilab. Yeah. And so I, I worked on that. It was a good experience. OK, so there you go. I still have that. That was probably in 1990, maybe. OK, okay Maxwell's equations. Pay-per-view. Okay. 
Maxwell's equations. So these are the equations that uh, build a relationship between um, electric and magnetic fields. They're super important. So the first thing, a lot of times we'll talk about flux. So the electric flux is defined as uh, E dot n hat dA. So if I have some area, there's a square, and n hat is a vector perpendicular to that area, and then I have an electric field like this all over the place. And E dot n hat is going to give me a component of the electric field that's perpendicular to the area, and then I multiply it by the area, and that's flux. Uh, so if the electric, if you have a, a non-constant electric field, or you have a, a non-constant surface like a sphere, then you may have to do this in, in, as an integral. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere that you actually integrate. Uh, we always cheat to make this to work, uh, and I do. I'll try to include a video down below where I do uh, numerical integrations of flux for things like a, a charge in a cube, and it's kind of fun. There's also magnetic flux. And you may guess this, it's B dot n hat dA. So a lot of times we'll deal with these fluxes, but you don't actually necessarily have to. Uh, okay, so here's the first of the of Maxwell's equations, and it's called Gauss's Law. And it looks like this. And this is in integral form. Now, there is a differential form of these two, but I don't think you need those. So this says the, fl the electric flux through any surface. It doesn't have to be a real surface. It can be imaginary. It's proportional to the amount of charge inside of that surface. So if I have a positive charge right here and I draw a, so a surface over there, then the total flux of that surface is going to be zero. Yes, there's going to be electric field over here and electric field over there. But if I integrate over the whole surface, this is negative flux because it's pointing inwards, and this is positive flux. And if I add it all up, I get zero. Okay. If I put a charge inside of there, then I can actually use this to determine the magnitude of the electric field. Now, be careful because this isn't something uh, that totally tells you. Gauss's law doesn't totally tell you electric fields. It tells you some about the magnitude of the field. You have to already know something about the direction of the electric fields in order to use Gauss's law. So I can use Gauss's law to find the electric field due to a point charge by picking an appropriate surface like a sphere and integrating over the sphere, but it's an easy integral because the electric field is perpendicular to the area in every case for the sphere. But, but I already knew the, the direction of the field, right? So it's not just like the superposition principle. Uh, it's a little bit, it's a supplement to that. But that's Gauss's law. Uh, should I write Gauss's Law? I'm afraid I'll misspell it. Gauss's Law. Now there's also this one. This is Gauss's Law for magnetism. So it turns out that no matter what surface you pick, you get a zero magnetic flux for a closed surface. And that's because we don't have magnetic monopoles. We don't have individual magnetic charges. It's almost like they're always come in pairs. Uh, the the simplest magnetic field you could get would be would look like the electric field due to a dipole but then you have two you have two charges so it kind of goes away okay so next we have um, ampere's law ampere's law says this that's right ampere it says uh, the this the integral of b dot dl equals I'm gonna write the whole thing mu naught times i n plus epsilon naught d d t the integral of e I should do Faraday's law next n hat d a so let me write down Faraday's law too um, this circle right here notice that this is different than this this is the flux this is the flux over a closed surface, so that's why I have that circle in the integral. That means it has to be a completely closed surface, and this one too. Uh, and that's this is not a surface integral, that's a path integral, but that's a complete path. So then we have Faraday's law, which says this, E dot dl equals uh, negative d dt, the integral of 
b dot n hat da. Wasn't there an extra part to that? I feel like there's an extra part. I feel really dumb right now because I I know this I know this really really well. Let me look it up. Uh, let's see. Let me, I'm gonna look up what I wrote. <laughs> Sometimes you just kind of go boom and you just kind of just blank out, right? I know there's a like a uh, Gauss's law. Gauss law for magnetism, Faraday's law. No, that's it. I thought there was Ampere Maxwell law. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I was right. Okay. Yay. Yay me. Okay. Oops, I messed up. Okay. So Faraday's law says that if I have a magnetic flux through some surface, and that magnetic flux is changing with time, that's what this derivative says right here, then I get a closed path integral of electric field that's not zero. This is really weird, right? Remember this. Here's my electric charge. Here's my electric field. If I had some closed path, I should get E dot DL is zero. And this is not zero because this is what we call a curly electric field and this is a Coulomb electric field. So if I have um, a dipole, right? Uh, I'm trying to think of another, let's, let's do this, an electric current. So here's a current coming out of the paper. Then the magnetic field looks like this. That's right. It makes this circular path. If I integrate B dot DL along that path, I don't get zero because B is in the direction of DL. If, but over here, I would get zero. So this says that if I have a changing magnetic flux, I get a curly electric field. It's kind of a big deal. Okay, it's kind of a big deal, but that's what that says. Now, what about Ampere's law? Ampere's law says that it's a lot like Gauss's law. It says that the uh, the magnetic, the integral of the magnetic field along some closed path is related to the current passing through that path. And that's that. Okay, but then we have to add in this extra term which is makes everything balanced, right? This says that a changing electric flux also creates a curly magnetic field. So let's just review. So we can make a Coulomb electric field. There's no such things as Coulomb magnetic fields. And Coulomb meaning uh, a single point charge with uh, electric uh, field lines radiating outwards. So, but in terms of curly fields, I can make a curly magnetic field with a current moving charges or a changing electric field. I can make a curly electric field with a changing magnetic field, magnetic flux. I can't make a curly electric field with a changing, uh, with a magnetic current because I don't have magnetic monopoles. So otherwise I'd have another term in there too. So these are Maxwell's equations. Um, and this is very important because with this you can show that light is an electromagnetic wave. It does not need a medium to travel through space. It can travel through empty space because it is its own medium. Okay, so what did I miss? There is other stuff in there. Um, I didn't do electric charge. I didn't do electric field energy density, the magnetic field energy density. I didn't do electric pressure. Uh, I didn't do um, optics. Uh, I didn't do AC circuits, but those, these are the most important things that you really carry on and depend on other, uh, other classes depend on this in physics. So, okay, hopefully that gets you started on your preparations for uh, your physics final exam. Uh, if you need to make a cheat sheet, some of these equations would be good. If, and again, if you write these in different ways, that's completely understandable. Okay, everyone uses a slightly different format, but the ideas are still the same. Uh, I'm gonna end there. I hope you do well on your test. I hope you study hard. Uh, Remember, it's just a test. It's not, it's not a test of who you are. It's just a test. Okay, sometimes those grades are stupid. Don't get all upset about it. Uh, we all do poorly sometimes. Trust me on that one. But I believe in you, and I think you can do well, and I will talk to you later.